writing across the curriculum. And what that means is that what that means is that you're going to have writing for every class. It may come in a different form. Um, for example, for a science course, you may have a lab report. Believe it or not, our tutors can assist you with the fine tuning of your lab report. A lot of people don't realize that. So it's not just a typical composition essay. Um, it could be anything from your research paper, your lab report, a reaction paper, a journal entry. Um, we are actually expanding with the writing support. Even when you're preparing for graduate school and professional school, you know, you're applying to law school, applying to medical school, whatever, they require sometimes a personal statement. You can draft the personal statement and we'll review it for the grammar, the punctuation, you know, we'll give you some insights into how you present the information. We also work closely with the people in career advisement, the career development office, and you know, they have experts that know the kinds of things that you should include in a letter like that. So it's all a partnership. And like Jake was saying, they support what we do and back and forth and the same thing with the other departments. So feel free to use us. Let me just get a quick show of hands. How many of you have come to the tutoring testing center? Yay! Yay, yay, yay. I'm very excited to hear that. And I hope it's been a wonderful experience, but even if it has not, or if it's fallen short in any way or something new you would like us to, to try to consider to do for you, please let me know. I'm the director. Uh, part of you know, my charge is to, to chart the course for our office and to make sure we have the latest input from students in terms of what it is that you need so that you can be successful. Um, and like I said, we have a lot of other programs. We have an MCAT MOS test. We have an IQ speed reading program. A lot of things that people may not you know, have heard too much about. Maybe I'm not sure if you're mostly freshmen, sophomores, or any of you junior, seniors, like in the later stages. Okay, so if you're not a junior senior, we have some nice opportunities to prepare you for graduate or professional school, um, which you may want to inquire in our office. We have some special things. But at every stage, we have different things to support you. So anyway, today we are here to talk about mo mostly learning styles. Have you heard of learning styles? Just a show of hands. Okay, so you've heard some generic things. Okay. And it's good to kind of know what your preferred style. Now, when we even do this little inventory that we're going to do today, I just want you to know that whatever the inventory says doesn't mean that is it. That is what you are, and that is the only thing you are. No, this is a very brief inventory to begin to generate some ideas and thoughts in your mind so that you can go out and explore even more. And then hopefully give you some tips and strategies that you should, based on your learning style, that you should really consider when you're studying, organizing material, and preparing for a test. And I'm even going to go into some pointers as to strategies or tips on the day of the test. And depending on the type of test that you're taking, whether it's essay, multiple choice, true, false, short answer, some, some strategies that you want to always keep in mind um, so that you can be your most successful. Um, but obviously, you have to have the content knowledge. No strategy we provide is going to be effective on its own unless you're putting the work and really attending class, you know, doing the things that, that you need to do, keeping up with your lectures and all of that. So anyway, so to go into our presentation, my first slide talks a little bit about sort of a more holistic concept of organization, staying on track. And my first item on there for staying on track is living a healthy lifestyle. I mean, probably how many times have you heard that? Um, I hope you use and take advantage of the RESPLEX. We know it's a popular service here at the university for students. Just being healthy overall will keep not only your body functioning well, but your brain. Because your brain needs all those nutrients, the oxygen and everything in order to be at its peak performance. So don't overlook this. Sometimes as a college student, um, we know procrastination or cramming comes into play where you're staying up for two nights in a row because the test is on Wednesday and I couldn't sleep the two days before. You know, there's anxiety related to that as well. But take care of yourself. Do make sure you get that night's sleep the night before. You know, so that's why you need to plan and that's part of your organization plan. Um, I would encourage and I would hope that all of you are using a planner. I would assume so. Can I just show a hand quickly? Yeah, okay. And there's all different methods and systems for doing that. It could be paper pencil if you like that better. Some people actually put a planner up on their wall because they're, just, they're very visual and we're going to get into the learning styles and they like to kind of be reminded um, of, of the different things that are coming up. Um, when you have those kinds of visual type planners, it's very good if you're a visual learner, 
when we get into the learning style, to color coordinate. So one of the tips we give in our office is if you are going to put like a planner or something on the wall with all of your commitments for the semester for a class, color coordinate. Let's say you have four classes, five classes, you give each class a color and, and pinpoint when your exams are, when your papers are due, because you have it from your syllabus, right? So you review your syllabus and you plot it all in and you put it all in different colors. And let me tell you, that can tell you so much about how well in advance you need to organize and plan and study. Because if you look at that chart, and even from a distance, you don't even have to be close to it. If you have it color coordinated and you see all these colors piled up in one week, which could be final for midterm week, right, because a lot of things are due at that time, you know you better start planning in advance. I'm talking two weeks, three weeks, maybe a month out before, especially if there's a paper and you need to compose a research paper in stages. And what I would suggest too is that at each stage of that development of that paper from your research to going to the library to identifying your sources, to your outline, to your first draft, at every stage of that you can come and use the free writing tutors that we have. These are professional tutors that are trained to sort of be not your editors, but want to be careful because we promote independent learning. We want you to walk away with skills that will make you confident and independent on your own. So they're not going to sit there and mark up your paper, but they're going to have a conversation with you at any stage. And based on their expertise and obviously the other students that they see, they can really give you some good pointers into sort of the direction. But you always lead the tutoring session. The tutor's not going to say to you, this is a B paper, this is a C paper, this is a D paper. They're not there to evaluate or judge. That's what your professor is going to do. They're there to say, okay, what is your assignment? Are you clear on what's being asked? Are you answering the question completely and accurately? And then they can sort of guide you. And maybe you've missed a couple points and they can say you need to elaborate a little more here. So, um, so those are really good things. So this is just part of this larger plan of staying on track, being organized, and living a healthy lifestyle. And it's going to lead to better grades, all of it together. Uh, review your material on a regular basis. Now that goes back to the brain. There's only so much you can overload your brain with. And there's research, and I'm sure you can do it. I didn't bring any statistics here. But usually, if you're not taking good notes and reviewing them on a continuous basis or getting together with your friends, that works really well. But only if it's an effective sort of group. Not when you're like chatting about other things and then you get off on a tangent. So you really have to stay focused, obviously. Uh, but, but working and studying with either a study buddy or even a small group of students has been shown to increase your retention potential in your brain. All right. So repetition, obviously, the fact that you're reviewing, um, discussing it with others. And again, it goes back to your learning style, if you're auditory, maybe just having discussion about certain points in the lecture with others is going to help that learning sort of get more ingrained in your brain. Um, keeping up with your reading assignments. Oh, can I say that enough? I mean, we hear from faculty. They get very frustrated because students, they find or they report, don't read their textbook and are not reading. And again, there's so much that you read online. I know you're online and you're reading things. And maybe you're just reading for pleasure or for other reasons. But you need to read those textbooks. You know? And some of those textbooks nowadays are even available online. You know, they come with a supplemental material. I know a lot of the math and science books come with a code that gives you like the textbook and the resources online. And just in case you didn't know, they even come sometimes with free tutoring videos that are embedded with your book. So I see some people nodding, so I know you know about this. Some of you know about this. But these are great resources as part of your larger study plan. Break your studying into smaller units. Again, that's because of the limited capacity to retain if you're just cramming too much. Determine the type of test you're preparing for. So, you know, every professor is different. So usually you learn a lot about the professor. Sometimes they put it on the syllabus, the type of test they're going to give, or they'll, they'll share it. But if they don't, and you're going into that first test, I think it's a good question, it's a valid question to ask in class, what type of test, what, what style of test? And uh, I use all multiple choice. Or, you know, and based on that, you can really tailor how you prepare for that test. Or at least, you know, be prepared for what you're going to get. Um, and then find the study technique that works for you. Like I said, it's not going to be cookie cutter. It's not going to be the same for everybody. And it could be more than one style, even when you do the inventory. It may give you a preferred style, but then 
you may have a secondary, maybe the two work really well for you, so you have to use them in combination. Okay? So now we're going to pause for about five minutes, so we can put up the next slide. What learning style are you? And we're just going to look at three, but there's research that's been done on other, um, and they get a little more complicated. But these are the primary three that, are, that I'm sure you've heard of, visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. And if you want to put the next slide, it sort of explains what each of them pertain to, which the visual would be the visual learner, obviously, that you learn mostly by seeing, looking. Again, we're talking about these diagrams, these colors, the schemes, you know, lectures that are very vivid with presentation. Um, maybe even rewriting, because when you're writing, okay, that's kinesthetic because you're doing, but you're also visually looking at the material again. So sometimes even rewriting your notes that you took from class. Or um, uh, when you're reading your textbook, annotating, it's called, when you write in the margin. I don't know if you, you know, some people like to sell their textbooks and they don't want to write on it, but if you can, or if you have a PowerPoint, you know, kind of writing in the margin of the different points. Or even if you have questions as you go along, you can jot your question on the side and continue. And then you go back and you know something that maybe you need to explore more. Um, auditory, obviously, like I said, the listening. So this is where maybe studying with a buddy, where you're actually talking about the material. And some students, believe it or not, sometimes just read something out loud. And just reading it out loud somehow allows the brain to hear it again. Instead of just reading like inside your brain in silence, reading out loud when you hear your voice and speaking can, can make a difference in terms of your retention of material. So let's take five minutes. And let's get you engaged in a very brief exercise. Now, all of you should have gotten a copy on the way in. And this really should not take more than five minutes. So let me kind of guide you. What you're going to do, you're going to go down the list. And you're going to just be as honest and don't overthink it. Just get your natural response as quickly as possible. And then you're going to just check off for that particular item. Is it often what I do, sometimes, or seldom, meaning rarely, never? Um, because if you notice, each of those has a ranking on a number, like seldom has a five, a three, and a one. What we're going to end up doing at the bottom is we're going to be tallying up those numbers, and then we're going to see which is your stronger learning style preference. Okay? It doesn't mean it's the only one. And some, some people even get two that are even. So and that's a possibility. So let's see about a minute. And uh, I'll walk around and see if you need any help. But I think it's pretty self-explanatory. So you know all you're doing now is putting a check um, that is for the box. I'm not sure how quickly you make it on number list, but when you get to the bottom and you see those three areas that have numbers, the numbers that you see at the bottom of the visual auditory synthetic are referencing the item or the particular question at the top. So for example, question one is the very first one on the auditory. So then you're going to see the score based on the check for that particular column. Okay?
to add up your scores yet, some of you. One more minute, and then I want to have a little discussion with you, because I want to know about your findings. Let's try to have a little talk here. Who would be brave enough to share <laughs> what their strongest, um, or if they had a, uh, a match, if that's possible, to, or a quote? Um, okay, go ahead. I don't want to get a visual. Mm -hmm. So it would depend on the So it was a significantly higher score than the other two. Oh, yeah. Now, do you find that to be true about yourself? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh -huh. I mean, Mm -hmm. Okay, good, good. And, you know, part of this process, of course, I'm going to share tips and things, but I also want us to hopefully learn from each other. So do you find, I mean, do you find that this is an affirmation? This is something that you know to be true from your experience. Yeah. So have you used that knowledge in any way to prepare for exams? What kind of strategy have you used? Uh, we, most of the teachers, when they put the classes online, Mm -hmm. I download them ahead of time so I can look on the board and also on whatever I have in front of me. Okay. And also because I'm starting to use it through the other second password, I can write all the passwords that I have. So it helps me to have like, the, 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 what they say on the board that I'm writing to the password. To the back. Okay. And do you find, I don't know if you've ever tried it, color coding things? I've never tried it, but I could try it. Too. That might be a new one. What do you mind? Yeah. Um, even flashcards? Have oh, you, yes, you do flashcards for studying? Okay. Even your flashcards, you could color coordinate mm -hmm. by subject, you know, or something. It just, for a visual person, that color coding just speaks. It speaks to you. So it just, it, it, you know, it's, it's pretty good. So I'm very visual. I love the color coding. Mm -hmm. And we recommend it a lot, especially for. Like I said, if you have a visual planner of like all of your assignments for the semester, mm -hmm. as a matter of fact, in our office, we have a sheet, like an 11 by 17 sheet that we've created mm -hmm. that is the term at a glance, we call it, the whole term. Mm -hmm. And we just give them out at the front desk. So you can just inquire, you can say that I sent you, and Lisa mentioned during the workshop that there's a term at a glance calendar. And um, every semester we update them, you know, with the new dates for the semester. Mm -hmm. And we even highlight in a different color midterm week and finals week. So it's already sort of like pre-programmed there for you and then all you have to do is plot in every other test, every other paper, things you have to do. So it's a useful little tool. So come by and pick one up if you feel it could help you. Anybody else would like to uh, share a little bit about their score, their style? Yeah. 
You're strong all across. So, um, but the visual seems to be the strongest tendency. But it could mean that a combination of different study strategies that cut across could be helpful to you. Um, it's very unique to you as an individual, obviously. And you know, I'm glad you kind of mentioned the other things. I did attach some other handouts. I'm not going to go through each and every one, but I wanted for you to just walk away with something that perhaps you can go back and study and refresh on a little later. Because it's very quick and easy to look at, you know, the three learning styles, and it gives you like a bulleted list of some of these key concepts and terms of things you should be trying. Like we just talked about the flashcards, or you know, annotating, and like you said, the PowerPoint uh, diagrams of concepts or, or things of that nature. Uh, for the auditory learner, I know it's not as popular nowadays, and you really do need the permission of your professor to even attempt to do this. But some people record the lecture but only if you're allowed and only if the professor is comfortable with it. So if you feel that might be helpful to you if you are a strong auditory learner, um, if they allow it, then you can record the lecture and then listen to the lecture later. Um, or again, like I was saying, if you're getting together with a small group and you're studying concepts, just talking through the concepts is going to help that. Anybody here auditory? Because I know usually most of this tends to be very visual. I think most of us carry that visual if it's going to be strong. Um, but I'm curious to hear, because I'm also very strong in auditory. That for me. So anyone else? Yeah. So can you say a little more? Do you find that to be true about yourself? Yeah. Okay. Any particular strategy in terms of auditory that you think do work for you? Okay. Okay, okay. So, so for you, probably just live in the actual, you know, listening, but also seeing that PowerPoint and, and you know. I record it and then have to attach it to something that would help me a lot more. Okay, okay. Well, you know, some of these sections are being recorded, so um, if you need a refresher at a later point on any of these topics, you can go back and, and look at that too or listen to the audio. But I'm so glad you shared. Because I don't think it's as common to hear about an auditory learner or someone you know, who is visual and auditory at the same time and, and how you can combine strategies. Anybody mostly kinesthetic in the group. So it wasn't as strong. All right, but not to leave them out. I mean, the kinesthetic person would be, of course, like I mentioned, could even be as simple as just rewriting your notes. Um, we had a particular tutor that worked in our office because you know some of our tutors are undergraduate peer tutors just like you, very talented students who aspire to go to medical school and all of that. And this one student um, was a bio major, chemistry major, and he was preparing for his MCAT. And I would see him literally pacing with his notes and flashcards or whatever, and he would pace back and forth and back and forth. And it was just that kinesthetic aspect that the movement just help the brain activate certain circuits, you know. And, and it really does work. I mean, it's, it's, it's science that's been proven. And I would urge you to, I, I listed some sources and some of the materials that I've shared with you that are online. Um, but really, I mean, learning style literature is expensive. So this is just a little bit of an introduction. But for you to consider that it's important to really understand what works for you. And it, and it seems to me you guys have a good grip on that. So keep doing what you're doing, and if anything, expand on what you're doing, and maybe try some new things. Um, so very good. Any final questions about the inventory? So we'll go on to some tips and strategies for the day of test. Any, any questions for them? Did you, did you gain something from this? I was old. Okay, very good. All right. So let's get going. So now we know a little bit more about how we learn. Okay, so let's think, okay, day of test. Okay, you've studied, you've prepared, it all comes down to assessment, right? I mean, we're in college. You are assessed in everything you do. And you have to be able to, I mean, you learn the material, 
And you're here for the purpose of learning, not just learning to the test. You know, there's a difference. Memorizing material and dumping it in the test, and then you walk out the next day and you don't even want to know about it anymore. There should be some retention. <laughs> there should be, you know, part of learning being in college, and that's, that's where you're engaging that higher order thinking and that critical thinking, is that you walk away with really a new wealth of knowledge <laughs> and a new perspective on the world and new ideas, and that you begin to generate your own ideas that contribute. That's really what it means to be part of higher education, to be part of academia. Um, how many of you want to pursue graduate professional work? Congratulations. Yes, do so. Because I'm sure you've heard the bachelor's is no longer enough. <laughs> you need to get your master's and beyond. And I wish you all the best with those endeavors. But all of these skills, if you master them now as an undergraduate, are going to pay off big time when you get into the next level. Because so much more is going to be expected of you at a higher order, more independent thinking, and for you to create and generate ideas. So it's no longer just reading about other people's ideas and then giving them back to someone on a test. It's going to be about how you make connections and you begin to generate some new ideas. So anyway, day of test. Well, before the test, actually. <laughs> And it goes back to what I was saying, this holistic approach of being organized, living healthy, get that good night's sleep, do eat some breakfast. If you have a test first thing in the morning, don't go without breakfast. Have a little something, <laughs> oatmeal, banana, or something. Just, it, it really does make a difference. Water, being hydrated, all these little details do make a difference. Now your attitude, okay. A lot of students sometimes say, I have test anxiety. And you know, there is something that is a true test anxiety. And I can even tell you seriously, the um, counseling services here, if there is someone who is experiencing true test anxiety, meaning heart palpitations, sweaty hands, shaking, you forget everything, you can have counseling. There is counseling available and they can help you develop some good strategies for relaxation and all of that. But generally, generally when people say have test anxiety, what they really have is perhaps lack of preparation, um, not confident that you did what you needed to do. Maybe you didn't have a plan that you followed through. You crammed the night before or you didn't sleep for two nights. That's the anxiety that's going to be generated. So that's why it's so good to use these strategies but really be very planful and organized. And that's why I started with that whole concept of being organized because that's going to be the foundation for all the studying you do and how you prepare. Um, but be confident of what you know. Okay, let's say you've done everything right. You study, you did your flashcard, you started two, three weeks ago, you didn't cram the two nights, you got your good night's sleep. Then at a certain point, you have to sort of put it aside, take a deep breath, walk into that room, confident, you know, I know everything that I believe I should know for this test. And talk to yourself is what we call visualization. And I'm sure you may have heard it with athletes and so forth when they go to the Olympics or um, a big game. You know, they're visualizing that they want. They're already seeing themselves. Winners. I mean, you can visualize yourself. You've got the text. You know the material. Um, you've got the grade you really wanted. So you can begin to have those positive um, reinforcers in your own mind so that you're ready for that test. Definitely don't cram. Relax. If you do get a little anxious, take a few deep breaths and just relax and, and walk into the room and arrive early. And if you have some flashcards, you know, you can use flashcards. They're, they're so portable. And I know it's a physical document, but nowadays you could probably put them on your iPad or you know, whatever you're carrying with you, if it's a little, you know, easier for you to look at. Wherever you stop, there's usually a Wi-Fi signal everywhere you go. I mean, there's definitely a million ways to connect with the material that you need to study. Um, but for your test, obviously, you know, don't set the alarm and then the alarm didn't go off and I'm running and I'm late and, you know, I've heard stories, students missed the test because the alarm didn't go off and they were up the whole night before. Just avoid those pitfalls. You know, avoid those kinds of pitfalls as much as possible. All right, so moving on. So you're ready. So before the test, you are ready. Now, okay, now this is actually the day of test when you get the test. There's some basic, basic things. First of all, you should know in advance, like I said, if you can ask or if it's in the syllabus, make sure you know what type of test you're going into. So you can kind of, you've already prepared for that. Um, look at the exam in its entirety very briefly. Obviously, don't spend so much time, but, but review it. If it's like five pages, kind of go through all five and just sort of make a mental note of how much time you think you'll need to dedicate to each question. You know, there may be multiple choice in the beginning and then at the end there's an essay. And if there's a short answer essay, how much time do I think I need for that, for that essay? 
excuse me, it could be 10, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Just make sure that you sort of planned in your mind how you're going to break down. A test is usually what, an hour and a half to two hours, you know, when you're taking it? So you, you need to sort of budget yourself. <laughs> uh, never do anything until you've read the directions. Read them carefully because sometimes people jump into the question and it could be something as simple as which of the following is not, and we'll get into that. And then maybe you miss the not which is telling you a lot about what you need to say. So read each question. Never choose an answer until you've read all of the possibilities. So if it's multiple choice, A, B, C, D, E, and then the final one, all of the above, you know, you could get through A and B and, I don't know, maybe you're nervous, you're hasty, you make a quick decision, and it really should have been one of the others. A and B are correct, B and, you know. So read everything. Never change an answer until you're pretty certain that the reason you're changing it is the right one because they do say usually your first reaction. I mean, obviously, if you're reading too quickly, you, you want to read carefully. But if you, you're given that answer, don't go back and change your answer unless you have a good reason that you're telling yourself why. And let me tell you another little trick. Sometimes the first few questions you're answering, um, and then when you get to the end of the test, there are other questions that sort of shed light on the beginning questions. I see some heads nodding over here. Have you experienced that? Yeah, sometimes it may not be exactly the answer, but it's not your number something that you look at. Somebody can have a visual, and I see that. Oh, I wonder if you mentioned that. A related concept, right. And that related concept can spark, oh, yeah, I remember that one. And now, wait a minute, question number two was about the same thing. Let me go back. So if it's something like that, yeah, I'll definitely change your answer. But um, usually they say the first one you got, don't, don't question yourself too much, is the bottom line. Because then, then you're going to get confused. And it could be the anxiety and then get to the better of you. Academic integrity, I have to mention that because after all, you know, in higher ed, academic integrity is key. You have to rely on your knowledge and your information and definitely no cheating or anything of that kind, which obviously we would not expect from any of you. So. All right, so multiple choice questions. Evaluate the question, consider the answers, Find clues, process of elimination. I mean, if there are four or five options, probably one or two are pretty much like, oh, I know I can get rid of these two. And then it boils down to two or three. And then you really need to think carefully how it's worded, what it's asking for. Uh, examine, read it again. Examine your qualifiers. The qualifiers are things like all, always, all, uh, only. Uh, conservative qualifiers, those are very definitive, absolute qualifiers. Um, conservative qualifiers can be like often, most, or rarely, or usually. Um, so just analyze those questions carefully and see the answers um, that go along with what, what's being asked of you. And one of the strategies you can use the day of test is circle those keywords. So when, when you go and reread again, that keyword is sort of guiding you into what the answer possibly could be. Okay, budget time for each question, also the test. Okay. Essay questions. Essay, make a quick outline if you can before you start writing. Um, again, usually if it's a timed exam, an hour and a half to two, it's going to be a short answer type essay. I mean, unless you're in a composition course where the entire test is an essay, perhaps, but um, 15, 20 minutes. So maybe jot down some bullets as to kind of the key points that answer the question that's being asked. Um, try to get right to the point, especially for a short answer essay. You can't get too much in the introduction, as you would, let's say, in a research paper, where you're elaborating on what the question was or, or different sources of evidence. They're just asking you to answer the question. You need to really get to the point very quickly. Begin with your strongest point, and then build on that. Be concise and stick to the essay requirements. So always going back. And again, if it's helpful to circle the keywords in that essay statement, what they're asking the prompt or underline so you can go back and say exactly. And, and there could be multiple parts to that question. You could say describe and then, and then explain or something. So you know there's two keywords asking you to do something. Um, and we'll get into some of these keywords too in the presentation. And then if, you always allow a little time to review for your grammar, your spelling, your clarity, your legibility. Legibility, especially if it's a handwritten short answer type thing that you're doing in the classroom. Um, so leave time for that. Because sometimes if the professor, no matter how great you wrote it, if the professor can't even read what you wrote, they're probably, they might take away points or they won't even be able to grade it at all. 
Um, some common key words that come up in terms of, like I was saying, what these prompts may ask you to do. And these are the ones you may want to underline. And just kind of understand what it really is asking for. I'm not going to read each of them as we go down, but you can see analyze is asking you to divide and examine parts of a whole. So they're asking for very specific things. Compare, identify similarities and differences. And all the words, you know, sometimes when you look at them, they say, well, it's all the same thing. It really is not. If you're very careful and look at it carefully, they are asking for very specific things. Contrast, identify differences, critique. Now there you have to give some supporting evidence. You can't just say my opinion. My opinion based on what? Based on some knowledge, based on something you've read, um, you know, within the sources of your class, of course. Okay, okay, so let me kind of speed it up a little. All right, true false. Most tests have more true than false answers, on average. Okay, so just a tip. If there is no guessing penalty, remember it's a 50-50, then take your chance and put an answer. Don't leave it blank. You know, but that's only if there's no guessing. Some exams do have a guessing penalty, so be careful. Be aware of the qualifiers, kind of what we were talking about before, the never, the always, the every. Uh, when they're used, it means that the statement must be true all of the time. So if part of it seems true, but part of it is not, and it has one of these qualifiers, then you have to you know, assume that it, it must be true all of the time. It's not its fault. Qualifiers, like usually, sometimes, generally, can sometimes be considered true or false, but they can go either way, depending on the circumstances. So that you have to analyze very carefully what it's asking you. But if any part of the question is false, then the entire statement is false. So that's the one that's a little more hopefully. If any part of it is false and it's just true or false, then it's false. Okay? If part of the statement is true, it doesn't necessarily make the, the entire statement true. So it's sort of like the reverse of the other one. Um, it, it's usually easier to pick out the false one than the true one, but there will be more true ones because that's really testing your knowledge in terms of you know what you've learned in class. Okay, so I've given you some very quick pointers and strategies. So I hope that even if there's one or two new ones that I'm giving you today, that it's something new that you can try. I really want you to, you know, attempt from these things. But after the test, don't forget to reward yourself. Definitely identify your knowledge gap. You know, many professors do give the exam back to you. And if they do, use that to your advantage. We even have students who bring it to the tutoring center. And they work with a tutor on, okay, you know, one through ten, and seven and eight I got wrong, and I think I know why, but let me go over it with you again. Because it could be that at the end of the semester, if it's a cumulative exam, you're going to see those points come back. And if you haven't touched upon them, you kind of let them go, because you, maybe you've got a B, and you're happy with a B, and you're like, ah, oh, I'll put it aside. But if you fill that gap, maybe the final exam is an A, because now, now you've got the whole picture. Um, reward yourself, work with your instructor. Don't forget, your instructor is acceptable to you during office hours. How many of you have ever seen an instructor during office hours? Great, great. And especially here at NSU, I know one of the reasons I believe you chose to come to NSU is because it is a small setting. You have individualized attention by faculty, so use that to your advantage. And they're usually very approachable, very helpful. But don't forget about the tutors. We're here for you as well. And some students just find that perhaps a different approach or a different way of explaining. Because remember, the tutors have taken the same classes, and some of them took it with the same professors that you're taking. So they can give you a little more what we call the insider's knowledge on tips and strategies, things that help them be successful but that, again, you can try for yourself. Um, some references, again, there's lots of materials online in different places you can find. And my very best wishes to all of you to do the best in your exams. But remember, it's not just the exam on its own. And that's why this topic was sort of melded together with study strategies, organization, and learning styles, because it's really sort of all combined. And the more you master all of them, really the outcome is the test result. And the better test results when you put all these different strategies into play at the same time or in conjunction with each other. So um, I think that concludes. So any questions? I'd like to take any questions.